and the title of this session, Are We Ready for a New World Order? Kelly, this is moving very slowly, but it is potentially the biggest change to money since, I don't know, currency consolidation after the Civil War. So we're watching it very carefully. Yeah, a huge step for mankind, Steve. Why would anyone pay $69 million for a JPEG and a Hyperloop? Well, the organizers here are nothing if not ambitious. This is, I think you will agree, a daunting subject for discussion at just after 9 a.m. on a Wednesday morning here in the relative calm of Expo 2020. But tackle it, we must, because I believe what is clear is that we have hit an inflection point. We are certainly living in a unique age of uncertainty and volatility in global affairs. Looks like the grim cloud of fascism is spreading over the whole world, inexorable. Well, that was 9th February 1939. Haven't changed my opinion since. It's just gotten worse. This year is on pace to set a record for ice melt here in the Arctic. This warming is enough to bring about the raft of effects we call climate change. Our hosts for this essential summit understand that it's only through international cooperation that we can reverse the devastation caused by man-made climate change. Under Trump, they abandoned minutes, moved to seconds, 100 seconds to midnight. That's where it is now because the threats are accumulating. We're approaching the most dangerous point in human history. Nothing like it before. We are now facing the prospect of destruction of organized human life on Earth from environmental destruction and not in the remote future. We are approaching irreversible turning turning points which cannot be dealt with any longer. I don't think we're going to see a period of depression unless the virus takes a real turn for the worse. It may not be as serious as a depression, but there are various shocks hitting the economy at the same time right now. Your Excellency, are you ready for a new world order. And so I think we have to go deeper. And it's not about the US versus China. It's about what underpins a world order is always the financial system. Mm. Uh, I was very privileged. My father was an advisor to Nixon when they came off the gold standard in 71. And so I was brought up with a kind of inside view of how very important the financial structure is to absolutely everything else. And what we're seeing in the world today, I think, is we are on the brink of a dramatic change where we are about to, and I'll say this boldly, we're about to abandon the traditional system of money and accounting and introduce a new one. And the new one, the new accounting, is what we call blockchain. It means digital. It means having an almost perfect record of every single transaction that happens in the economy, which will give us far greater clarity over what's going on. Put simply, blockchain is a permanent record of transactions linked in order or a chain to act as a timeline or ledger. And in Bitcoin's case, it's purposely decentralized. Central bank digital currencies can be blockchain-based or not, depending on the design. It also raises huge dangers in terms of the balance of power between states and citizens. In my opinion, we're going to need a digital constitution of human rights if we're going to have digital money. Uh, but also, this new money will be sovereign in nature. Most people think that digital money is crypto and private, but what I see are superpowers introducing digital currency. The Chinese were the first, 
the US is on the brink, I think, of moving in the same direction. The Europeans have committed to that as well. And the question is, will that new system of digital money and digital accounting accommodate the competing needs of the citizens of all these locations so that every human being has a chance to have a better life? Because that's the only measure of whether a world order really serves. But these cautious institutions are now buzzing with talk of a revolutionary concept, a form of money you cannot see, central bank digital currencies. Don't come to any particular conclusion about it, but they say it could offer the, uh, the general public a risk-free digital money that is free from credit risk, free from liquidity risk, would not replace existing digital money, but would be an addition to it. Surveillance and privacy issues could arise if the central bank is able to monitor every transaction. You know, it is being implemented across the world. China's experiment is very large scale. When the world arrives in Beijing next winter for the Winter Olympics, uh, they are going to be using the new digital RMB to shop and, and to stay in hotels and, and buy meals in restaurants. The world is going to see a functioning CBDC very soon, uh, within the coming year. Well, so far, Visa and MasterCard are already uh, offering central banks uh, around the world that have uh, goals or ambitions of moving into a, a central bank uh, currency to use their infrastructure to be able to do it. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a realization that uh, that is the direction we're, we're heading in. Unlike your savings in a commercial bank, which rely on the bank's promise to fulfill, CBDCs are recognized by law and backed by the power of the central bank, which cannot go bankrupt. For example, if a commercial bank collapses, part of your savings could potentially be wiped out. But this wouldn't be the case for CBDCs, which could be as trusted as cash, as convenient as a payment app, yet also benefit from the same blockchain technology which underpins cryptocurrencies. And just like cash, CBDCs could be distributed through commercial banks, avoiding too much disruption to the financial system or the central bank having to deal directly with many millions of citizens and businesses. In order to participate in Beijing, the Chinese government is requiring everyone to download an app called My2022. Athletes, journalists, spectators, everyone there must put this app on their phones. What is China's goal as it rolls this digital currency out during the games? Well, you've got to remember that uh, cryptocurrencies uh, pose a threat to the ability of any country to control its monetary policy and therefore its financial system. And these uh, central bank currency, especially the one in China, is sort of an attempt to, to offset that risk. And I think that uh, I think it's a good idea for any central bank to develop one. And certainly China is the most advanced uh, in this area so far, having started this uh, project as early as 2014. Steve, it's interesting to look at what's happening in China with some of the experiments they've been running um, with digital currency. It might make it harder for our Fed because obviously China can do more tracking of citizens' use of the currency. Um, they can use monetary tools that our Fed might want to pursue, like putting an expiration date, for instance, on currency when they're trying to stimulate the economy. But it does seem like they'll have to face down concerns on a number of different fronts and maybe clearly delineate what a digital currency can and can't do. You've got that absolutely right. Uh, uh, there are major privacy concerns that come with this uh, kind of uh, currency. It also means that for the first time ever, the government will be able to track citizens' transactions in near real time. The rather confusing term being used to describe this capability, controllable anonymity. Controllable anonymity, to my understanding, it promises a kind of horizontal anonymity. So uh, you can think about the counterparties that are involved in a transaction can't necessarily access each other's personal information. But uh, there is no promise or no guarantee, rather, of vertical anonymity. So any kind of user information can be readily available for the government. So I think that obviously has surveillance implications, even though that's not necessarily uh, in the official guidance documents.